lead to the final phase of the war of the South. Well, this is a period from 1778 to 1781. The British had been convinced, despite Moore's Creek Bridge, that the South was loyal, that the South was not interested in this revolution. But the problem is, is that the British had uh, wanted to enlist slaves to increase the strength of their army. And when they began to do this, they freaked the South out. There was nothing scarier in the world to a slave owner than a black man with a gun. Because they had been treating these people terribly for a long time. And so for the British to come along, train them how to fight and give them guns, that was more than any Southerner could bear, regardless of how loyal he was. And so that loyalist support that may have existed in the South up to this point completely disappears. Now the Southerners... Oh, where's our one? Uh, now the Southerners uh, will adopt a new way of fighting. Um, and this is going to be basically in a, a fairly early version of guerrilla war, which actually they, they stole a lot from the Native Americans. They're going to sneak attack. They're going to divide their force. They're going to hit and run. They're going to attack supply lines and, and basically make life hell uh, for the British. In 1778, uh, Clinton, uh, General Clinton, the British general, places Howe uh, in May of that year. And he moves the British Army from Philadelphia to New York City. And that's really all that happens in the North. I mean, the, the war is pretty much over in the North. Uh, about the most spectacular event left in the North is Benedict Arnold uh, will uh, commit treason. Now, Arnold was an incredibly brave and able soldier um, who had proved his heroism and his confidence many times. Uh, but he kept getting passed over, and, and he was very angry about this. And mostly he was angry because many people who were there made it pretty clear that he was the great hero of Saratoga, that he uh, was the one who led the, the, uh, the, the attack that, that caused the British to surrender, which essentially kind of won the revolution for America. Um, but because he wasn't the ranking officer, there was another officer named uh, Horatio Gates there. Um, Horatio Gates wrote the report and didn't really give Benedict Arnold much credit. And Arnold, consequently, was also shot in the foot at the battle, um, although it didn't stop him from fighting heroically, apparently. And so Arnold felt like he never got the credit he deserved for Saratoga, and he became bitter. Uh, Gates, um, apparently paranoid that Arnold was going to make him look bad, um, helped arrange for Arnold to be sent off to a fairly meaningless post guarding West Point, which is, of course, today the military academy for the Army. And Arnold, through his wife, who had strong British connections, um, was offered a commission in the British Army if he would give West Point to the British and turn coat and become a British officer, and he did. And this is said to greatly shock and upset the, uh, uh, the Americans, including Washington. And so today, Benedict Arnold's name is synonymous with treason. Interestingly, if you go to Saratoga, the battle that many uh, historians and many people at the time feel that Arnold was most responsible for winning, you'll see this monument to him, which represents him being shot in the foot as bloody boot. But his name does not appear anywhere on the monument. It just calls him the soldier. Um, this is a, a four-sided obelisk uh, that's at Saratoga. And three of the obelisks have uh, colonial commanders who won the battle within them. And the fourth one is left empty, uh, as if they're not even going to acknowledge Arnold's existence. The colonial commanders in the South included people like George Rogers Clark, Francis Marion, who had the, the cool nickname the Swamp Fox, and Thomas Sumter. Uh, these were all Southerners who, who adopted and, and in many ways created this uh, uh, guerrilla-style warfare, this uh, non-conventional-style warfare. But the most important commander in the South would be Nathaniel Green, who was actually from Vermont, and he uh, had been recruited by Washington to be a general, and is arguably the, the most able general in the war and the most creative general in the war. Um, Washington had his purpose and certainly accomplished extraordinary things, but in terms of a military mind, uh, I would probably say Nathaniel Green uh, was the great uh, general of this war. Green will lead the American army in a, in a complicated series of battles in the South here. I'm not going to run through them all individually. Um, uh, but uh, he's going to lead his inferior army to victories over Cornwallis, uh, who's now in charge of the British army, at, uh, in, in October at Kings Mountain, um, where basically a bunch of backwoods farmers kill or capture uh, 1,100 uh, uh, men fighting for Britain. Um, Green will break his army into small, quick pieces, and Cornwallis will simply be unable to catch up to them. Uh, Cornwallis will win, I mean, I'm sorry, Green will win probably his most important victory at Cowpens uh, on January 17th of 1781. 
And this Carolina campaign will end with a, a, a British victory at Guilford Courthouse uh, in uh, March of 1781, where Cornwallis loses so many men uh, that his commander, General Clinton, will order him to retreat, uh, even though he won the battle, uh, to Yorktown, which is this peninsula here, uh, uh, there on the Chesapeake, so the British Navy can come uh, pick up uh, Cornwallis' army and the British can decide what to do next. Now, at this point, the French, um, uh, under uh, uh, Rochambeau and uh, uh, Admiral de Grassi, will concoct a scheme where they use Washington's army to come around on land and basically the French Navy to, to seal off this, uh, this uh, peninsula that Cornwallis has marched down. And so Cornwallis is now trapped, cut off from both his supply line on the ocean and supply line on the land. Um, he is uh, unable to do much of anything. Uh, the Americans will attack, um, but this will be the end of the war. Uh, and on October 17th, 1881, Cornwallis will surrender. Um, the British Army will play the world turned upside down as 7,000 men are handed over to the command of George Washington as uh, prisoners of war. And the world is turned upside down because a colonial power, uh, which of course had been considered inferior all this time, has now beaten the greatest military force in the world. Um, and it really dramatically changed, uh, the, and it will go on to change for the next few centuries, this relationship between colonies and their master countries. Now, it's going to take two more years before the war officially ends, and what's going on during this time is that the, the voting public in, in England has turned against the war. Uh, Prime Minister North loses his job as Prime Minister over this, and a new government, a pro-peace uh, government, is voted into office, and peace talks begin. Ben Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay will negotiate for the Americans. The French will offer to serve as negotiators, uh, working between the two sides, uh, but the French will, will prove to be a lot more interested in helping Spain than, than anything to do with America. Uh, they want England to give uh, Gibraltar. Uh, which is on the Mediterranean, back to, to England. Um, but the British aren't interested in doing this, and so this actually slows the writing of the treaty down for almost three full years. Uh, when it's finally written, uh, the, the, uh, the Americans go behind the French backs uh, and, and, sign the, and negotiate the treaty independently with England. Um, this would have possibly created real problems with the French, but Ben Franklin, who got along well with uh, the French diplomats, was able to smooth it over. And in the end, America would get what you see here on the map. Everything from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, uh, aside from Florida, which is of course owned by Spain, and Canada, which Britain holds on to.